Now I want to tell you a story of two siblings. Myself and my brother David, we were both abused in two different ways. What happened to me was certainly way worse than what happened to him. Mainly for him, he just had a pitifully pathetic example in my dad. My dad drank and he was mean and cussed all the time and told filthy jokes and he was a mechanic and out in his garage he had all kinds of dirty pictures of women and so my brother grew up seeing all that kind of stuff and my dad thought it was funny when my brother was 14 if he'd get drunk and do stupid stuff like that and he never went to a ball game, never went to a school function, never did anything. So we were both abused but certainly The type of abuse that I had was very devastating. However, my brother was found last December in an abandoned building in Los Angeles dead at the age of 57. He'd already been dead 30 days when they found his body and it was so decomposed that the only way they even knew to call me was because he had a, an old worn out ministry badge in his pocket from the few years that he worked at the ministry. And we had to send his dental records for them to identify him. And to me it's one of the saddest things when I think about it because of the opportunity that he had in front of him. He was 10 years younger than me, so at 57, his decomposed body in a warehouse, all alone, nobody even missed him. He was dead 30 days before anybody even found him, and then it was another transient street person that found him. And here I am at the age of 67, well 68 now, preaching the gospel to two-thirds of the world. The promises of God are for whosoever. There was no reason for his life to turn out the way it did. It wasn't because there was nobody to help him. It wasn't because everybody else always got ahead of him. It was simply because I wiggled and he didn't. If you need a miracle, all you got to do is wiggle. You shake that dirt off your back and you get up on top of it. And you say, I'm walking out of this mess. If anybody can be blessed, I can be blessed because I'm a whosoever. <clears throat> My brother was very irresponsible. We're going to put up a couple of photos. I want you to see my brother. This is him when he was about three years old. And that's him when he was 17 and went in the Marines. Now, if you could just leave that picture there for a minute. Just, I want you just to think about the possibility that was before him. It's, it's easy to see he was very good looking. He had a fantastic personality. Everybody loved him, even though you wanted to wring his neck half the time. You, you just couldn't keep from loving him. Some of you may remember him from the few years that he worked in our ministry. At that age, and he had so much possibility in front of him, what happened? Well, he went in the Marine Corps at the age of 17, and there his sergeant introduced him to drugs. They were in the jungles in Vietnam, and very unpleasant and hard place to be. And so he started taking drugs there, but he already had a lot of bad habits before he went just from the way that he was raised. Our mother had a nervous breakdown when he was about 14 and she was not really present to take care of him. She was in the hospital for a long time. And so my brother at the age of 14 was pretty much taking care of himself because my dad worked nights and he'd go off to work at night. My mother was in the hospital so he could just run the streets and do whatever he wanted to. And 
So he went in the Marines, and I know he went in the Marines at the age that he did to get away from all the stuff that was going on at home. And when he came out, he was angry about all the injustices he'd seen. God only knows what goes on in a place like that and what it takes out of a person to live like that for that long. He came home, came back to St. Louis. He got a job at a car manufacturing plant, got married, had a son. And as responsibility mounted, he began to hide in drugs and alcohol and blaming, blaming, blaming other people for all of his problems. I beg you tonight, stop blaming other people for what does not go right in your life. Maybe you can't help what happened to you in the past, but you can help what you do about it now. Did you hear me? And if you don't do what needs to be done, I can pretty much promise you that nobody is going to do it for you. People may try to help you, but there's a part that only you can do. God will hold His hand out to help you, but God Himself won't even do your part. He will give you the ability to do your part, but He won't do it for you. Amen? When we become passive in our will, it is one of the most tragic things that can happen to us. God has given us free choice. Constantly choosing right over wrong is what we're supposed to be doing. And the more we do that, the easier it is. The less you do it, the harder it is. It's so easy to have a life that's just been a big mess and then just blame, 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 blame and lay by the pool and wait for a miracle and hope for the next well-known preacher that's going to come to town to, so you can get in the miracle service. And I'm not saying that God doesn't help us. My goodness, He is a miracle-working God. He does great things. Prayer works. God anoints people to help us. But how many of you know that I'm telling the truth when I say there is a part that only we can do, and if we don't do it? But if you'll take these principles and you'll say, if God can do it for anybody, God can do it for me. If Joyce got miracles wiggling, then I'm going to wiggle. If the donkey got out of the pit wiggling, then I'm going to wiggle. I'm a whosoever. A whosoever. And I'm going to do what I can do. It's not much. It was a little boy's lunch. Five smooth stones in a slingshot, but he killed a giant. It was a rod in Moses' hand, a stick, but God filled it full of power. Moses kept saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God said, what's in your hand? And he, a stick, a rod. He said, throw it down. He filled it full of power. God doesn't care what you don't have. What he wants you to realize is that with him, you can do anything. No, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Every time you wiggle, you're making a little bit of progress. Every time you forgive somebody that's mistreated you, you're making a little bit of progress. Every time you're the first one to say, I'm sorry and make peace, you're making a little bit of progress. Every time you keep your word when you don't feel like it, you're making a little bit of progress. We don't, we don't get a pass on not doing what's right because it's hard. Well, my brother finally got divorced. He left town, never paid child support. When he worked, he worked for cash so he wasn't in the Social Security system, otherwise the state who was supporting his child would have tracked him down and made him pay. This is just one of the reasons why our country is in such a horrific mess. People don't take their responsibility, then the government has to keep people from starving, and then our taxes go up, and it's just an endless cycle. And it all starts with people just not doing their part. And there are people who obviously need help. I don't mean that. We help people. 
right here in this city all the time, and we will continue to do that. People need help. We need to help one another. But even somebody that's in the most terrible condition in the world can be taught how to wiggle. <laughs> Amen? If you need a miracle, what do you need to do? All right, so my brother left town and he went to Arizona. And over about the next 15 years, I guess, he lived with one woman after another, never marrying any of them, never paying any child support, taking drugs, doing whatever he could do to get them. And then he called and got Dave on the phone one day, and, which we hardly never heard from him, and he was sick and in a mess and had gotten the idea that he wanted to get his life straightened out, and he asked Dave if he could come home if we would help him. So, of course, Dave said yes. And, we went to the airport and picked him up, and I was glad he was coming home because I, he was, he's my only sibling, and no matter what, you've always got a special place in your heart for family. And so for four years, he lived with us in our home, and when he came back, a lot of his teeth were missing, and, and the ones that he had were rotten, and so we spent the money, and we got all of his teeth fixed, and, and we took him to doctors and got him healthy and counseled him, and he got born again. And, filled with the Spirit, and he was just, he would say things like, I love our life. I just love being part of the family. And so he, he got in good enough shape that we could hire him at the ministry. And, you know, a few of you might remember my brother David. He, he's just such a good-looking guy. Let's put up the pictures of when David was working with us. There he is next to Dave, worshiping God. That's me and him. He lived with us for four years. Well, toward the end of that four years, I started really losing my grace to have him in the house and just be constantly having to take care of him. And, you know, he went to work when I woke him up. <laughs> he brought his laundry to the laundry room if I told him to. <laughs> he cleaned up his mess at night if I told him to. He did, he did what I would tell him to, but he wouldn't do anything without oversight. Come on now. And, um, but he was getting to the point where I felt like he'd be okay on his own. And so I talked to him and I said, we really feel like that God wants you to get out on your own and, you know, be a man, stand on your own two feet and, and we'll help you. So obviously we had to sign for the apartment and we had to help him get the furniture. And in the process, we'd bought him a nice vehicle to drive and he had nice clothes. We wanted, we wanted to treat him good. We wanted him to feel the love of God. We wanted God to use us to love Him into wholeness. But I can pretty much tell you that all that time, He didn't add to anybody's life. It was always take, 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 take. But I'll tell you one thing He said 20 times a day, I love you, sis. I can hear Him saying that just as plain, I love you, sis. And He did. Unless it was going to cost him something, unless it began to hurt, unless it required something out of him. You know, just those words aren't enough. People have to put action to them. And so sure enough, after he got in the apartment, it wasn't real long and he wasn't showing up for work on time and we'd call and he hadn't woken up. It was always another excuse. And then he was having a girl there with him a lot of times. And they weren't married and didn't take a Einstein to figure that out. And so in the midst of that time, they'd also, because he'd gotten back in the Social Security system through working for us, they began to garnish his wages. And he owed $60,000 in back child support. Well, obviously, that was devastating. He's like, well, you know, I'm trying to get my life straightened out. Now i got to pay this $60,000. They're going to garnish you my wages. I'll have to work for years and years, and I won't ever have any money. So then he started blaming the woman, saying the kid probably wasn't his to start with. He was angry. He was mad. He was bitter. Well, he saw a lawyer, and the lawyer was able to get the $60,000 reduced to twenty-seven. dollars I'm yet to figure out how you can bargain with those kind of things, but you can. So 
He got it reduced to 27,000, and he was still angry and mad and didn't want to do it. And he didn't realize it, but Dave and I had already talked about it, and we had prayed about it and decided that if he would just do it with a good attitude for about six months, then we were going to pay it off for him. I wonder how many times God has somebody's deliverance already planned. But he's just watching them for a little while to see if they will wiggle. What he should have said was, you know what, I deserve to pay this back. I didn't take care of my son for all those years. I was wrong. There's no excuse. And he should have just manned up and did what he was supposed to do. You know what? If you've spent money like crazy for 30 years and you are deep in debt and God has been dealing with you and now you know the truth and it's time for you to just man up or woman up and get out of debt, you probably aren't going to be able to buy much for a long, 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 long time. And you need to keep a smile on your face the whole time and you need to say, I lived riotously over here. Now I deserve to have to go through this and I'm going to learn a lesson. I know, I know this is a little hard. Well, then we had to let him go from the ministry because of the way he was living. And so we sent him down to the Dream Center in St. Louis to go through the men's program down there. And that turned out to be another nightmare because they couldn't keep him curtailed either. So then he went to live with our elderly parents who I was already taken care of. So now I got two 80-year-olds and this... 47 year old guy that wouldn't work and wouldn't do anything and I'm like God Can anybody do anything besides me? Anybody feel like that sometimes can anybody do anything besides me? So after a while he ended up leaving town again going back to Arizona didn't hear from him for another probably 10 years in the meantime, the girl that he was living with called me several times, giving me a rough time because I wasn't helping my brother. And here I am, I'm this famous TV preacher, and I'm helping all these people all over the world. And you should be, you should open a bank account for me and David, and you should send money out here and put it in this account every month so I can take care of him because he's not able to take care of himself. I said, no. And it was not easy to say. You know, I finally figured it out. If you've tried to help somebody for four years and they're not helped, then they just don't want to be helped. And I'm going to tell you tonight that you are not doing yourself a favor or the person you're trying to help if you become a crutch for them. Because all they'll do is drain every ounce of energy and life that you've got, and then they'll go on to somebody else. Help everybody you can. But even Jesus didn't go around saying, please, can I help you? Oh, please, can I help you? Oh, listen, would you please let me help you? I noticed in the Bible that Jesus helped those who came to him. Come on. He helped those who came to him. There's got to be a willingness on our part, too. Yes, you cry out to God. God, come into every problem that I have. Help me. Do miracles in my life. But I can tell you what's going to happen. God is going to show you what to do. Come on now, I'm telling the truth. He's going to show you what to do. First thing might be forgive all the people you hate. Well, I can't do that. They didn't treat me right. That's not fair. Well, then just go ahead and go around and around the mountain. So my brother finally called again. Well, the girlfriend called. She said, your brother's basically mentally ill now. He thinks he's got bugs crawling around in his body. He's paranoid. He thinks people are out to get him. He really wants to get in a treatment program. Will you guys please help him? I said, yes, if he'll get help, I'll help him. But I'm not just going to send him money. So we sent one of our pastors out to Arizona to get him. And I want to show you what he looked like. You saw the picture when he was worshiping God in these meetings. 
This is what he looked like 10 years later after the devil got done with him. Now, when my brother died, they sent me his personal effects. By the way, we picked him up. We took him to the Dream Center in Los Angeles. I didn't, we didn't think it was wise to have him back in St. Louis. We took him to the Dream Center in Los Angeles. We're friends with the people out there, and we partner with them. And they said, oh, yes, we'll work with him. We'll help him. And they'd pretty much already told me if he's willing to straighten out, he can live here. We'll even give him a job here and, and uh, really you know, help him get his life back. So he was there 30 days. He got off drugs, stopped smoking, got off of alcohol, got cleaned up. He, was, he, he knew how to do plumbing work, so they put him to work doing plumbing work there in the, the center. And after 30 days, they were just getting ready to give him some spending money. He was going to be able to have a little bit of free time. And after 30 days, he went to the, to the guy who leads the, the, the men's program there, and he said, you know what? You guys are great, and I really appreciate everything you've done for me, but I'd like you just to take me over to the VA center and drop me off. This is just not for me. Well, what is for you? Somebody do it for me. Somebody fix it for me. Somebody else make my life work because I'm not even willing to wiggle. Now, when they sent me my brother's personal effects, I didn't really understand the impact that that was going to have on me. And I'm preaching this whole message tonight because many of you have a decision to make. And many of the multiplied hopefully millions watching this program by TV, you have decisions to make in your life. You can feel sorry for yourself for all the bad things that have happened. You can do that if you want to. It might even be understandable. I remember having a little argument with God one time, and He told me to stop feeling sorry for myself. And I said, well, you know, I was treated like a dog growing up. Who wouldn't feel for, sorry for themselves? And He said, you have a reason to, but no right to, because I'm willing to heal you. So you may have a good reason to feel sorry for yourself, but you really have no right to, not if God is ready, when a holy God intervenes. But God, but God will come and intervene in your mess, but you are going to have to wiggle. I didn't know how it would affect me when they sent my brother's personal effects, but I got a deep message when they did because here they are. This is what remains of my brother's life. My personal effects at this point are stored in a 218,000 square feet of space, almost 1,000 teachings, 90 books, 14 offices around the world. I'm not bragging. I, this is not what I'm trying to draw an analogy. We both basically came up in the same household, had the same blood in us, I was treated worse than him. He died of his own choice in an abandoned building at the age of 57, looking like he was 75, when he could have been working with us, traveling around the world, being loved by millions of people. He, God would have used him. He was a great guy. And this is what's left of him. Now, I want to ask you tonight, when you go, what's going to be left of you? I'm calling every person tonight to make a decision. What's going to be left of you? Is this message coming across loud and clear? That's sad. I mean, that is so sad. The potential when you think about the 17-year-old boy that went in the Marines. The potential that he had. And this is it. It's a dirty watch, a worn-out pair of glasses, a package of business cards. He had his ID badge from when he worked at the ministry. The few things in his life that he was proud of, that's what he had. Still carried his ID badge from the ministry and had been gone 10 years. I'm sure there were times when he took that out and thought, I wish I would have. I wish I wouldn't have. 
Don't end up at the end of your life with nothing but regret. No matter what your condition is right now, you are a whosoever.